Good evening. You should all be extra pleased with yourself. You're not only attending a poetry reading, but you came through serious torrential conditions. Um, welcome to the second poetry reading in the Holloway series of the semester. I'm Jeffrey O'Brien. I curate the series with Alex Walton over there. We're really fortunate to have Andrea Brady all the way from the UK by way of North Carolina this year, which made it more possible. Thank you for coming. Um, we're going to hear a reading by John James, who will be introduced by Joseph Serrano, and then Noah Warren will come up and give Andrea an introduction, and Andrea will read. There are many books by Andrea available over here, courtesy of Mose. Please come and consider them after the reading and talk to our poets. And I'll bow out of the way. Joseph, thank you. Joseph. I'm a first year in the English student with uh, John James, uh, first year in the English department with John James, um, and I had the privilege of reading some of his poems last night. So, um, of the many themes in the poems John James will be reading this evening, one that immediately strikes the reader is that of history. As the, as the poems remind us, both at the level of form and content, history, that is the English word history, as a word derived from others, runs in different directions and on different scales. Hence, the poems John will be reading this evening are at once histories on a grand scale, natural histories and perceptible to the individual subject, but not to the poem. And this perhaps invites us to think about the perceptive capacities of a poem and histories of an individual memory, a memory at times overtaken, assailed by its surrounds. From his father's grave to his daughter's crib, from the landlocked region of the U.S. to the reign of the California coast, from the trout that should have or could have been cooked over hot coals to the ashes piled on the streets of South America. These histories and memories are refracted through these poems. The images and, and thoughts sprout in and around the words. In reading and listening to these poems, we experience these environments. If these poems are indeed scenes of history and memory, we should recall them above all as still unfolding histories and memories. And so with that, I give you John. Hi. Thank you so much, Joseph. Um, thanks, of course, to Jeffrey and to the Hallway Committee for inviting me to read tonight. Um, Andrea, we're very excited to have you, although I have to apologize for the California raid, I guess on its behalf. Um, you get this wonderful trip to California and then this horrible weather. Um, anyways, but I'm, on that note, thank all of you for being here because um, you really did have something to brave. Um, okay, so this per first poem is the title poem of my forthcoming book, um, and it's called The Milk Hours. We lived overlooking the walls overlooking the cemetery. The cemetery is where my father remains. We walked in the garden for what seemed like an hour, but in reality must have been days. Cattail, heart seed, these words mean nothing to me. The room opens up into white and more white, sun outside between steeples. I remember now the milk hours, leaning over my daughter's crib, dropping her 10, 12 pounds into the limp arms of her mother, the suckling sound as I crashed into sleep. My daughter, my father, his son, the wet grass dew speckled above him, his face grows vague and then vaguer. From our porch, I watch snow fall on bare firs. Why does it matter now? What gun? What type? Blue smoke rises. The chopped copses glisten. Snow melt smooths the stone cuts of his name. Um, this next piece is called History N, as in History Noun, although I'm not necessarily committed to that reading of it. Um, it begins uh, with an ep epigraph from Plato's Phaedo. I'll read that and then sort of start the poem from the beginning. So the epigraph reads, 
I didn't make these verses because I wanted to rival that fellow or his poems in artistry. I knew that wouldn't be easy. But to test what certain dreams of mine might be saying, and to acquit myself of any impiety, just in case they might be repeatedly commanding me to make this music. <clears throat> History N. Viewed from space, the Chilean volcano blooms. I cannot see it. It's a problem of scale. History, the branch of knowledge dealing with past events, a continuous, systematic narrative of aggregate deeds, acts, ideas, events that will shape the course of the future, immediate but significant happenings, finished, done with, he's history. Calbuco, men shoveling ash from the street, third time in a week, and counting, infinite antithesis, 11 miles of ash in the air, what to call it, just ash, they flee to Ensenada. The power of motives does not proceed directly from the will, a changed form of knowledge, wind pushing clouds toward Argentina, knowledge is merely involved. Ash falls, it is falling, it has fallen, will fall. Already, flights canceled in Buenos Aires. I want to call it snow, what settles on the luma trees, their fruit black, purplish black, soot speckled, hermaphroditic. If this book is unintelligible and hard on the ears, the oblong ovals of its leaves, almost fragrant, Family name, Murdis, the wood is extremely hard. Ash falling on concrete, falling on cars, ash on the window shields, windows, yards. They have lost all sense of direction. They might as well be deep in a forest or down in a well. They do not comprehend the fundamental principles. They have nothing in their heads. The dream kept urging me on to do what I was doing, to make music, since philosophy in my view, is the greatest music. History, from the Greek historia, learning or knowing by inquiry. Historien, verb, to ask. The asking is not idle. From the French histoire, story, histor, Greek, one who sees. It is just a matter of what we are looking for. I forgot to remind you guys, uh, or to tell you guys, rather, um, that uh, the poem is a lot of sort of excerpting from various texts and stuff, so if sort of some of the language sounded like Hegel or something like that, or that it was. <clears throat> um, this next poem is called Metamorphoses. What was it this morning? You said red grass glistens and surf. The pine board fence collapsed along the line. After the storm, a kestrel and headwind, sand accumulates on your feet. Puckered seal skin. The salt-washed flesh, wreckage towing up shore. When the goals came out, I saw them circling in air, saw them pecking seal's eyes from torn skin. A boy down strand, rolling in dunes. I could see the stomach's red wall, the small hairs on its flippers, blubber wretched by shark bite from the belly swell. Later seen from a dune, black water, fish spit pooling, Mouth open enough to see teeth trailing in sand, his lips limp. There, in the storm's wake, I wanted something to say. The ocean scraped his insides clean. This next piece is titled Delaware I-95, and um, as you can imagine, it was written on a bus, um, either in Delaware or uh, perhaps somewhere in Pennsylvania, um, on I-95. Um, uh, I was taking my daughter, uh, we were coming back to Washington, D.C. from a place called Sesame Street, S Sesame Place, um, which is a Sesame Street themed park and it was about as fun as you can imagine. Which means it was a lot of fun for her. This is Delaware I-95. Cattails at lakeside constitute ecologies. 
Telephone wires dissect the sky, negate the coast's rusted corridor. Purple lupin erupts in the median. The sleeping child on my leg dozes, becomes aware, loses consciousness again, her cheeks flanked by marsh light, summer's hum, the blue idola of bug guts spattering the windshield and the cold mechanic valence of the lamps along the road, the round oaks rapidly scuttering into the sagged night, where thoughts low and turbid overflow winds in. Uh, this next piece is called um, Le Moribond, um, after Jacques Brel. Um, I'll dedicate the reading of this poem to Sam Benanti, who actually introduced me to Jacques Brel. Um, and who might remember uh, this, the, the little walk that this poem is about. Le Moribond. In the catacombs, I am impatient. In this hall, shuttling between one world and the next, from nothing to being and back again, I stand, restless, following the worm of thought to its blacked out end. I study the bones before me, observe fine cracks in the skulls, hairline fractures, the pits of teeth gone missing. History compounds. The skulls are yellow, tar-colored, mangled with dust, tucked along niches in the tunnels run. I am not ready to be among them. And so, for now, I wait. Tonight, I walk the city's soft keys, watch mist cloud over the Seine, people flicking cigarettes, striking guitars, strumming nickel strings, doing what the French do. Empty bottles lounge in the river. This far beneath ground, one hardly hopes to escape. Femur, tailbone, marrowless rib. Tourists pass, photographing the dead. Tombless remnants, unearthed by late priests. Nightly, their procession of cloth-covered wagons emptied the city cemeteries. A picture is a fine memento. Bones tell us little. In this network of interlaced tunnels, six million people lie buried. Many times the walls collapsed, combining the bodies of municipal workers with the ones we find here. It adds them to the tomb. The stacks of bodies are endless. Now, as I trace the path from one gray lamp to another, the pattern of lights between exits guides my walk through the cold. Dark letters urge me on, etched on a tableau of flat stone. Halt! Here is death's empire. Those who walk among them no doubt return alive, though occasionally lovers lose their way. Spend a night or two among the dead. My task is simple. Leave the bones interred. On the other side of these dim-lit tunnels, sun attacks the nerves. Inveterate monuments skulk from the square at Montparnasse. Their eyelids do not phase me. Death, whatever it is, sleeps below ground. It doesn't mix with the light. Fractures. Some of them died from only hairline fractures. Enough to place silence in a grown man's teeth, to plant his broken jaw beneath the dirt. This piece is called Spaghetti Western. In Georgetown, Indiana, the steel projector reels. The desert stretches blankly before us, a red plain constellated with rows of dry mesquite. Stone wall, still screen, a single emptiness, I suppose, throwing gray light over the tops of parked cars. John Wayne surveying the valley in a pair of seared chaps. Behind us, low hills roll off. The highway, congested, winds between them, an inflamed artery subjected to cloud cover. Nothing avoids the firm gaze of commerce, not the taut sky, the lake water rippling beneath it, not the fields of wild fennel, 
their tiny yellow flowers scattering spore dust. Sycamores doing the same. Tree sex, we say, then nothing. Cowboys rehearsing their pose. Two more pieces. This piece is called At Assateague. Um, Assateague is an island um, in the Chesapeake Bay, not, not this bay. Right? Um, it's an important distinction here. At Assateague. The sun is a thin line of red broadening over the bay. It slices the horizon, strikes light into a darkness poised to disclose some secret the night couldn't shake out of it. Trout smokes over hot coals. Wild ponies in the distance charge along the strand, kick sand up behind them, and an elegant cloud that smears the dawn's gouache. It's unbearable, this scene. It's sickening romance. Still, I want to hold it, to freeze its sudden architecture in the flotsam of the beach, to suck the ichor from its rib. It wouldn't sustain me, I know. The gulls turning their circles would grow dull. I berate the sand fleas itch. The gravitation of the tide's pull would choke me with ennui. Pear blossoms soon give way to pears. I'll never stop eating them. Um, and actually, of the poems I'm reading tonight, this is the only one that's a sort of a, a post-book poem. Um, I wrote it just in the last couple of weeks. Inspired, as you will be able to tell from the title, from, uh, from our recent weather patterns. This is California Winter. Hiking near Sausalito, wind slaps my skin. Bitterns turn on the horizon, pick fleas from the marsh grass jutting up along the beach. I lurch through a great opium of pines, halls of redwood shuttling me towards sea's edge. Strike at the path with a stick so old, my father's father might have held it, had he made it this far, this coast, this sea. Landlocked, I grew up. Barges floating coal down a muddied river. Grackles cackled. Black oaks lay down their roots by the fern. In summer, I walked my daughter to a garden twenty blocks from the capital. Picked quinces and persimmons, June berries and thyme. Hose in her hand, she turned it to the sky, let drops fall down upon her, a makeshift storm. Cliffs and bluffs, shrubs of manzanita spot the hill. The ocean fluxes in, breakers bursting on low dunes. Stagnant in mid-afternoon, Listless in the tide's revising loop, waves buoy me over sunk wharves, dead grass, the gray beach punctuated with cans, driftwood, egrets, laughter, rain. Thank you. Andrea Brady's poems are electric thickets. Moving into them, through them, we are wise to let ourselves be hurt. These are poems that can leap twice as fast as thought, poems that vibrate between deep lyric time and the late goo of capital, poems that mourn what they have to make, poems that gently show their teeth. Though she was born in Pennsylvania, Brady has spent most of her career in England where she is now a professor at Queen Mary University. It shows. I often hear notes of estrangement and betweenness drifting through her poems or structuring them. The elegiac diptych Bounty Hunter from 2004's Cold Calling, a book haunted by the American-led war in Iraq, seems set on a transatlantic flight. When Brady tells us, quote, thin tissue spread, over, spread itself over the cut webs placed in the old days now strong as marriaging steel, now soft 
to catch where the slipping thoughtful slides out. I hear not just a poetics of remediation, a technology to, quote, catch the slipping thoughtful, but also a meditation on a life, like a poem, cleft in two. The word marriaging also clues us. A poetics of catching the slipping thoughtful, whether it is her own thought or the world's speech column, is continuous with her archive of the now, a landmark online resource that is continuously preserving a crackling spectrum of contemporary British poetry, as with her sensitive editorship, editorship with Keston Sutherland of Bark Press. But the vast array of inner and outer landscapes Brady has captured through her many collections, charged with detail, thought, and feeling, is not offered freely. To share in it, to have our eyes dilated by her poems, we have to hear and accept their challenges. To our unconscious patterns of thought and perception, to the many guises of moral lassitude. But Brady's sharp gaze, wandering through the society we compose, scours it, and its end is new freshness, the shock of suddenly being alive. Please join me in welcoming Andrea Brady. Introduction. I'm going to just set my timer going here, guys, so that I don't go too, too long. Um, thank you so much for coming out, everyone. Um, it's great to be here. This is actually my first time in California, um, and I was saying to Jeffrey earlier, I, I almost came to Berkeley for graduate school, and I didn't. And it's, given what you've just said in the introduction, though, I always look back, back at that as one of those kind of forking points in my life. I guess everyone has them. Um, so here I am at last. Um, so I'm going to just start with a poem uh, from my collection, The Strong Room, called Marlowe One, and it remembers the meteor that crashed in Russia in February 2013 and landed on a lake. And I'm reading it uh, for Jeffrey and Hannah at the beginning of their adventures. Marlowe One. Sky head dashing through Chelyabinsk, distant, intimate. Tumble yourself out, shattering glassy fears we know no other. Life has always looked set to begin tomorrow. Its ancientness burns now the motorways and blasts out windows and boils the ice under which you lay so your corpse comes up like an apple. With a name writ in water, with eyes clear to water, transitional species appearing to watch your own appearance, your ill nature that loves to hide, pinks up and comes wired with songs. You give names to the unknown future, make its fashions specific. If you keep these almonds for eyes, will the rain glaze with universal justice your membranous head? Will you retain yourself in safety if your crushing or exhaustion is the black hole of thought? Will you scatter your radiant occult sugars over a world quivering momentarily with peace? Will you keep the nutty heat of the sacred in your thumb-sized heart? We page turn for you forever because life is actually very stupid, because we bide your admiration stupidly in proverbs, in grand precise speeches, in flashes better than this shows the limits of my power, a limit lying alongside you through our intimately broken night like the silver horizon of waters of promises whose writ you are the name. And that is as romantic as the poems are going to get tonight. You may have heard the uh, reference to Keats's epitaph in there. Um, what I'm going to do now is just read mostly from an, a, a manuscript that I've just finished called The Blue Split Compartments. And it's a book about drones. So it's also a book about hunting and uh, guns and racialized violence, um, uh, memories of growing up in Philadelphia. Um, and it's about intimacy, too. Um, drones are a kind of prosthetic violence, so that's easy to recognize, but um, it's also, a lot of drone operators have commented that um, they feel that even though they're 3,000 miles away, that they're actually, um, they, they feel as if they're 18 inches away from the things that they see on the screen. 
that's the distance between themselves and the screen. So this, in the, in the voyeurism of drone observation, there comes to be a kind of intimacy um, or a pseudo-intimacy between the drone operator and the, the objects, as they call them, that they're observing. So those, there are th those are some of the things that are referenced in the poem. Also, um, there's a lot about castration because drone pilots talk about themselves as kind of castrated fighter pilots. Um, so there's, there'll be some very strange um, quotes from Freud's essay on the Medusa later on. I just want to tell you that in advance so you don't think it's my opinion about the vulva. It's Freud's. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so here you go. Frozen. I think they should live our experience. The tarmac inequality, mile after boring mile. The same white strip, the same cat's eyes. The persona fades like early sleep and the hard world goes on hiatus. It's an eclipse in thought, parentheses, a subject dropped through a hatch. And still the hurtling machine, the glass shelter, the poisonous fire darts around obstacles, each a little cabin of self-preservation, only millimeters from catching death. You go on like this on autopilot for months, simultaneously totally present and a grating mass of absence, but able to do that job, which is not to die. And then that stupline moment when you catch yourself doing it. Had I been asleep for hours, my daughter floating in my palm. I was so engaged in the number plates and the colors, I forgot to recognize myself as a soldier. Hardly breathing, I crossed two lanes, put on the hazards. Snapping back exceeded the heart's strength to tolerate electrochemicals. My head swam with the bright proximity of violence. Some part of me must have wanted to. Saying some part locates that part as an alien object tapped into my viscera that can't really be found. I sip water, take a cleansing breath, ease off the pressure. pressure. Celebratory gold ribbons of rain cut the midsummer sun and anoint us. But they are wrong to do so, the mountains grilling like the roots of a tooth. Frozen. The substance of our universal rights is transcended by the idea, as when you cut off the legs of a table, the table falls, but the form of the table floats forever in the sky. The void is not ours to sample because it is infinite, not cleared for release. The thin composite body feels like dry paper, has overcome significant technical issues since its humble origins in balsa and ply. The void is a value made of formica, aluminum, cold rolled steel, red and common brass, forces the artist to occupy the site of a decision, part of a trend famously to boot out illusion, Donald Judd bringing the box into doctrine, stack them high and sell them, well, into the high desert, the colony of souls. Having occupied space, the surveillance industry was also moving into time. In actual space, we can pursue any possible form of relation. The people of the Juba region gathered around the sacrificial girl, her apron on fire, her fired face of clay, a color trace that was written by the curator and is being read in another room. The jar she holds, the length of a thigh bone is more rare. She is a box and she opens one. Somewhere, an artist starts building new tables, hammering out fan blades and motors. Anyway, you should come down. It's going to be lit. Opened. The scene at Molesworthy and uh, Molesworth and Alconbury, Crowton, is big data pastoral. The networks glimmer as we enjoy our breakfast, me and my friend. The starlight flaked off in her hair leaves glitter over the bed down location, a boutique country inn whose grain is polished by slow violence. In the square, there's a statue to a man who broke a record by shoveling bees into his pants. The bees were heavy and his face was greased. The English summer releases fluff and pinions. Its sky goes hazy with that era now only a dream in sepia and flightless predators. Sometimes you're struck suddenly with a claw when you're just trying to have a nice walk through a climatized safe zone, monitoring crops. But the propellers whistle and the reaper will never find his home. Oh, burning Julia, is that your blue light in the rushes? Where are you leading me? To the hospital, the pit, or the curfew? Frozen. 
Databases are instrumental, but they're actually a fairly terrible way to apprehend life, and the poor sap with the most links gets iced. Offered a chance to view her statistics, she does not choose to open the envelope. The chemicals have left almost nothing but green crystals, the odd button. A life in feet, bent as in study. Scalable vectors, incarnate cubes like raptors, persuasive patterns, press and seal that life to a more efficient gestural economy, whatever it is arguing with the fox bots. That life is radiant means that it can be captured. That the dash is still a human statistical trace from curb to coffee shop, factory, school, or market. Even if the novel nozzle at the center of the QR code won't stop spinning, it is ours target, downtown, those nations of laws for prediction for worker behavior. The workers' movement choreographed as light, like Zanana, our movement. Desultory and bewildered, we run from the factories, wander drunk into the archive, suppliers of a weaponizable pattern of life, and seed the clouds to make a film barrier, for plan soleil showers us with liquid metal, fruits, and golden sections. Frozen. The newspapers are again forcing me to choose between robots and immigrants while the data filters through the letterbox, a Chinese menu, drops on the mat, more raw material provided by the northerner in his van and white coat with fish on a Monday asking, anything for the freezer? Are they collecting this? Is this actionable? Has his refusal been sorted? He searches the guidance, lags to the man, puts the stats through a hot wash, but still the color and the tracker suck, the focus sucks. It was enough to make you think, but we didn't think. In this case, with respect, we knew. We had days and days of the unblinking eye the connoisseur searches for signs of freshness. Context and cold storage, there's no limit to the amount we can incarcerate. Ask Brescia about to burst vessels in her mother's living eye, knowing the names knowing their types and their perishabilities. Frozen. My body lies over the ocean. My body lies over the sea. My body lies over the ocean. So bring back my body to me. You scan the horizon, taking in the raw data, these erratic patterns deciphered and turned into actionable information, slipping twice on the slick of a verb. The only thing lacking is the living flesh. I feel myself coming into being like a wave passing down my body, that object referable in the mirror. It is known to others and so becomes known to me as blunt force. Every day something happens, such as I bare my teeth to the glass, a monkey instinct, my physical heritage tearing the red flesh from the ulna, but I don't take any notice of it. It's part of the repertoire of unspeakable humanness, activities which discriminate us from the beveled environment in the way a squirrel is not really an animal until someone from far away takes its photograph in a courtyard, and then someone from the hate industrial complex tweets that we need a final solution, running gunboats to deflect the dinghies. Her teeth are visible in the downstroke of every character, every repetition. Frozen. The Air Force practices above Anglesey. We are buzzed by jets on Dinastilly Beach. The mercury in the sea makes a ladder and mostly we can only hear them, a flash and they appear to be circling. Then they hover, so low no one can believe it, meters from where the children are digging and so slow, like cops cruising the corner, before they lift themselves up again and vanish. Realizing that we were not the intended target, they continued. Frozen. They're like mosquitoes. And when you don't see them, you can hear them. You know they're there. It destroys the logical processes of the mind. A man's thoughts become completely disorganized. The noise, madness streaming from every throat, frustrated sounds from the bars, metallic sounds from the walls, the steel trays, the iron beds bolted to the wall, the hollow sounds from a cast iron sink or toilet. I can't sleep at night because I hear them making that sound, that noise. The drones are all over my brain, I can't sleep. When I hear them making that sound, I just turn on the light and sit there looking at the light. Whenever they are hovering over us, it just makes me so scared. He said they saw 10 or 15 every day. And he was saying that at night time, it was making him crazy because he couldn't sleep. All he was thinking about at home was whether everyone was okay. I could see it in his face. Activated. 
This is the box in a state of activation. By entering this zone, you risk being plucked out and vaporized, but for the moment, you experience an open field that belongs only to you, the Sierra white floor you tread on, leaving no hoof prints. Your stalking thinness strangely hovering above a ground that does not belong to you, a state of exception roughly the size of an adult male body. And we track this paradox, the halo of your cell bobbing as you run through the rooms of your endless personal hostilities. In the eschatological tradition, the prey carries his death upon his person. And this is very painterly, but not adequate protection recognizing the frequency of Apache deep attacks. I can find no way around the thicket of laws and precedents. My mom's boyfriend and her brother forced me to try out the gun. Not the one that lay curled up in his sock drawer with the porn mags, but still a pistol and kanawa against the usual cans. I didn't want to hold it. The heaviness repulsive to my hand, the kickback, big joke on me. They said, you need to know how, but not why, which stalker would back me up the stairs and what they imagined was his color. They said, this is how country people live. My father's brothers harboring in the trees, drawing their enormous bows, were relative aristocrats, giving the prey its chance, taking theirs striking a line through the history of this land of men armed in blinds, bloody against nature. Frozen. My nerves were bad. The trees gathered the wind in their branches gently, holding it for us as noise alone, but not for long. Closed. Turns out I'm really good at killing people. Didn't know that was going to be a strong suit of mine. That's Obama, by the way. Hear how shallow this Molobros is, like an old furnace woman. I'd hit him with both my hands and knock all the teeth out of his mouth onto the ground like a pig gobbling up our corn and munitions. The poet is kneeling in the supermarket meat section, blessing the bleeding cuts. The factories are stuffed with living tissue. If I could learn the best way to kill, I might be justified in my hunger, but I have not learned, and I still have the means to eat. Feeling nauseous from all the switchbacks, my son looks out and says, that man has moved in death, but his heart will not stop falling into his stomach. He's been blooded, just like you would a hunting dog. I never needed to advertise my reproductive fitness by running around, trapping animals, bringing them home. My belly is round and intact, except for the split of its center where the muscles won't adhere anymore, leaving my guts spilling out onto the field of blood and treasure. So like most women, I hate this war, smoking the remains, hanging my head over the fire. Frozen. We shut our eyes, hide under our scarves, put our hands over our ears. Even when you don't see them, you can hear them. You know they're there. They're all over my brain. I can't sleep. There's nothing anyone can give us that makes it better. 24 hours, a person is in stress and there's pain in his head. If you bang a door, they'll scream and drop. It weakened my brain. My mind was so badly affected. If I'm walking in the market, if I'm shopping, if I'm standing on the road, we can't drive cars. We can't run out of our houses. Of all the progresses and advances in the modern world, only these reached us. Closed. The lost generation turned circles in the, in the sky. Zooming by proxy, they weep the derelictions of the blue on blue compartments. The schools are now all forward operating bases, each teacher locked and loaded behind a reinforced door, each primary child taught to maintain a tactical instinct and exit policy and homeroom. And the children that you spit on, take them out and cut them into prototypes for the STARS holding group. They offer no illumination as you struggle, eyes wide, to navigate through blacker-than-black maze of Konex dormitories. As a cop, I have 24-7 situational awareness on my beat or in this hotel. Imagine what this country could be if every citizen was trained to see each room as a potentially hostile scenario. I do. I see the rooms in Yemen, but the kids are not where I left them. They were exfilled with their hands in the air and strict instructions not to look to the left or right. 
It was a turkey shoot. There was no humanity in it at all. Then the findings come back, and it's nothing but single digits. Shut up in color. When they go back, they're relieved to find comfort animals. Not just puppies, goats and sheep, a cookie cutter shark and her pup in a tank in the mess. Their enemies have ghosted the teams and classes, not taking them out, just committing little ticky-tacky fouls on their competitors. Everyone who has been killed has thereby got a conviction. Now they have flies crawling across their eyeballs. It's a true test of endurance of the dead, who have permanently withdrawn their labor, who are on permanent lockout. The babies are born and kept in locked compartments because we come from the future, where it's all stars and ghost towns. Closed. Excuse me. When I was little, my father, Bunkered and Ramstein, used to describe some of the people he liked as down to earth. It was a phase, phrase of great promise. It marked the perimeters of our class anxieties. I am not now down to earth, I guess, or I can only be so by parking my work. To be down to earth is not to make a spectacle of your power. What was the opposite? What was implied? I never heard it. I think it has to do with flying, with keeping aloft, owning the sky. I simply could not blanket the sky with stars. We were too close. We knew too much. He was on the phone with his wife. I knew his name, his love of two-way, and retiring interest in militainment. I figured I couldn't miss him if I was touching him. Closed. What do you see? I see a man dressed in a drab flowing robe with a white cap on his head, casting a long shadow in the dirt. Where is he? He is in remote tribal regions. What is he doing? He is hiding in caves and walled compounds. He's training in empty deserts and rugged mountains. He's taking refuge. How did he get there? Red 1998 Suzuki Vitara, Hyundai Santa Fe, Toyota Pickup, Double Cab Hilux. Where is he going? From Wadi Sur Highway to his home in Hadalishak Village in Wadi Sur. Who is he with? Five men in a grove of date palms? What kind of men are they? Ragtag militants, rabbits in a dry hole. What do they hear? The shamal blowing in. What do you hear? Makar, cat fart. What will you say? EKIA is killed while meeting their fellows. What is red? The only thing hot enough around here to be a body. Activated. So this is a durational work which explores some notions of temporality and visuality under late capitalism. It takes place in this specially constructed box. A performative space which mimics the state of exception by inducing an extreme situational awareness within which seldom do we see the actual bodies. This box obliges viewers to engage in synoptic viewing using techniques drawn from sports broadcasting to reveal our acquiescence to persistent and totalizing surveillance. The artist who has presented this work at South by Southwest is associated with the new aesthetic, which is known for constructing politically inflected representations through algorithmically driven imaging and devices, borrowing both from modernist machine art and from the experiments of the conceptualist and op art of the 1960s. She calls this work the Gorgon Stare. Warning, flash photography and strobe lighting are in use, potentially inducing tactical blindness. Frozen. Falling for one individual among millions, it was destiny. Like the light of God picking out that single figure smoking up on the rooftop. Quite beautiful, really. One of the most objectionable relics of European art. You could only see more of her if she swallowed the camera. Though watching her so closely every day, knowing her to be untouchable now, you won't engage because she's next to kindergartens, under a crystal frame in a museum. In her pretty room, she is a separation, a damnable box of envy. 
while your experience is penetration, 18 inches to the ground, and this closeness predisposes you to experience every interaction as hostile. It's like you're fucking with your hands tied. Widow 87 licks his wounds, shaped like a mackerel, a head that looks like a camel's head. Airstrikes are like casual sex, point, click, forget. It wasn't my first one, but this one kind of stuck with me because of the intimacy of it. I like her, but if she fingers the engagement acid of burnt platinum carried by drone over San Francisco, flying the spattered flag of necroethics, bleeding heavily from a recent facelift, then she is served as I would serve a rat. Frozen. In a shipping container, fiddles, the compartment, hazy with data, blasted by air, con, watching thermal imaging of blood run cold. His stiffening reassures him of the fact, I'm not a hero, a hero is a sandwich. And he feels himself defrauded by object duty and castrated by the loss of his real wings. Snow hit blood stalks and pleasure stalked out like a robotic magnet, drawing men from their blinds and holes. No one then went to heaven. They stayed in Vegas, eating the water and the red line, popping their cherry at life, jovial, breaking their teeth on the stone. The skull and its hedonic wrapper became free in its own nature. The heads up screen was its wormhole to ancient misery, gamer tenses, the coarse sky black with digits. Frozen. Oh, little cup, go oh, snowflake. Look at the snakes in landing gear, how they mitigate your horror by hardening targets. Let them replace your penis, the absence of which is that feeling's cause. She wears it in the wings of the vulva from which the devil fled. Not a fleshy body, but a digital statistical trace. You okay, hun? Forrest Bess faints before he finished the split to exceed the soda straw thinness of chinquapin and pissing like an Arab, not a Pashtun, that being one of the tells, displaying the penis is to say, I'm not afraid of you. You have a blessed day, blinking your large eyes, fertilizing the queen whose ring you twisted when you suddenly went invisible. You remember that story. The vain chief and his trophy wife, the stupid Aris, eating his steak well done with ketchup and Riyadh, swatting his hand, tiny hand away like a fly. And what happened then? She was pissed, dressed for the job she wanted. That was the joke, a widow. She up and armed her invisible visitor. It's not a moral opportunity. He got the throne in her prosthetic jawbone, but she, these expensive, these is red bottoms, these is bloody shoes, she got the money and the blood of the man who pimped her to that common invisible dolt. Frozen. When I was in my 20s, I stopped coming. My friend said that emotions are technical, but I found technique to be emotional. I arranged a delivery to his compound. Sometimes I could go there by imagining the woman I had been watching for so many hours that her routines were more familiar than my own, undressing in a hotel room where they were attending a conference. So I sent him out to collect targets on the trains and buses. But my desire had been gathered up for her in my fist, more speculative than really actionable. And that was an emotional problem that became technical. I just lost it with all this privatization, the selling of our common resources just to make a few bucks. I dare you to believe that I am the subject here, that you are the object addressed. They say there is no relation, and what I want is the other's desire. But when she sees me finally coming for her, it will be his hands on the tits and propellers. Gunman, sergeant, she won't even know I'm in the room. Closed. I kind of freaked out. My whole body was shaking. It was something that was completely different. The first time doing it, it feels bad, almost. It is tough to think about. A lot of guys were congratulating me, telling me, you protected them, you did your job. It's what you're trained to do, supposed to do. So that was good reinforcement. But it's still tough. This was a weird feeling. You feel bad. You don't feel worthy. I'm sitting there safe and sound, and those guys down there are in the thick of it, and I, I can have more impact than they can. It's almost like I feel I don't deserve to be safe. 
mowing his lawn, the grass growing stupidly, hors de combat, and forever. Closed. It was later on, through a couple more missions, that the dream started, peaked by object stilt skin, this never-ending stream of nobodies. When you had an 18-year-old daughter that was a dream, and that dream was killed, jumping from square to square. On TV, it's the miraculously intuitive coroner again. He knows what the killer had for dinner. The problem is that when something goes bang here, it's a very confused place. So sometimes it's not even clear if something was dropped from the sky. Just something goes bang. The door closes on the room. The room snaps shut. The rhyme drops, putting the sun out. Why didn't he say possible, child? An easier word is bug splat, her eight face restored by an artist in 90 foot by 60 foot vinyl, laid over the blinded field, holding the shell of her former self in her pixelated hand. Maybe you should put a photo of Sasha and Malia there. A couple of crisis actors, these their headshots. Their dad used his constitutional powers to protect them from the Jonas, bro Jonas Brothers' lame-ass music. While in shitty little villages, the bugs do go splash indefinitely. Inside them is rich green. Frozen. He was killed by a quirk of fate. Their deaths do not cause as much pain as I feel now. He kissed me on the head before he went out. We laughed. Our laughter was cut off by two shells. When he went out, he was sound and healthy. I cannot enter his room. I thought that Resurrection Day had come. As he crawled away, pitting him lifeless to a wall, I felt as though I had lost half my face. They have killed him, and that is it. They have even become afraid of the sound of thunder. We could smell death. The car was ablaze. Trees were broken. We found the skull about 150 meters away from the car. There were four holes about one meter wide and half a meter deep. They took down the plate number and left. We started to exchange humor that they would attack us. Sugar, rice, and wheat flour were strewn over the bodies. People's lives are not so cheap these criminals can toy with us in this way. Closed. The chair bones connected to the sky bone. The sky bones connected to the nothing bone. The nothing bones connected to the nothing bone. Gonna walk around. Opened. My boy, are you tender-headed? You come home from kindergarten, if that is your acute privilege. I will buy you the new geox you asked for, the ones that don't light up and give away your location in a code red. Oh, fiddlehead fern, wrap that green patience around his body so easily punctured, so casually worn. God is good all the time. So he can be good too. To the knuckleheads in Chicago, my dad blames for escaping the reasonable application of the law as he considers buying his first handgun at the age of 72. The masculine and peremptory right to choose he aims at kids walking out of bunkers into the open air, which no one here ever believed was safe, was open. Opened. The blood is ready. And when it is ready, it falls. Seeing the large clumps drop into the water, I feel something akin to pride. It billows out in clouds like any mammal slipping its life out into the ocean. And when I'm standing, the ache in my cunt and my hamstrings makes me think about, oh, and I'm frightened of the animals sniffing around as I wait for the lead weight and the collar. Water makes this blood abundant. Though the mood is foul, the smell is foamy. It looks like uh, one of those in the uh, bright garb may be carrying a child as well. I write on the window that the child has disappeared. Someone I don't know answers, that was a dog. Closed. The patch on the beast of Kandahar says the wearer is alone and unafraid, like an animal or a god. Predators don't do elephant walks. The job of the hammerhead's hammer is to smash its prey on the ocean floor. Opened.
Dear Kari, or should I say, Lethal Berwin, I hope you're well, or at least surviving. The whole day has been stormy, caught us around the lake, the tree roots polished to a slippery web. The kids climbed brilliantly, finding treasure, making a fort under the stones. We even found John Brennan priesting around in his cave-like office, pre-hung with climber's hooks, the diagonal black cutting space exceeding its own debris. We were trying to collect video and evidence of whether the cell phone had been eliminated. The kids really got into it. We were lucky with the weather. Tonight, the massing clouds broke apart just long enough to make their resumption doubly foreboding. As the force clusters in anticipation of clear sky, I can just barely see the red streaks of taillights moving west around the curve where yesterday the 17-year-old boy was killed. The ambulance going by at 8 a.m. was the first thing I saw when I opened the curtains. Those taillights are a real kindness. I bet that's how it is in Kunar. Fellow, massive, fellow humans using the road they made, moving somewhere determinedly up into the dark, massive rock which can't be civilized. They call this route the Haymaker. Some return. I thought of you walking out there into the grip of justice. Did you dream of us, tucked in the warm, as we dream of you, standing where rock cuts the sky into zones? I looked at my son at dinner, and my look was enough to make him stop his barracking. What have I said, he said. I'm always cutting him back, keeping his manners in a can. Though he is the one who stands and roars at the sea, always finding something to throw into the, web, into the water. Stones, sticks, syringes, to show his strength, to hear the mark he makes. He gabbles and worries and shouts the song of ferocious joy at the wood and cries for the ball or dances backward just to be playing with the little tiles, their perfect medley of letters and number. Strips off his clothes and scampers over the rocks, using the thumb of his foot to show his strength and agility. Does your boy do the same? Anyway, the world continues. We fall on some of the most distant and unforgiving places on earth. Clouds ready to pour over the ridge have gone, and only the remnant of this day flattens out in a very cold, very pale blue that brings the sparse flatness of the western isles with it. The tea cooling in a cup, neatly folded towels smelling sweet, the polish on the back of the chair, the branches outlining the remnant of today's light, that light which is disappearing forever, the mirror's prismatic beveled edge, a lamb's head cudgeling the teat of its mother, smoke rising from the circle of tents and white minibuses. Carrie, I was thinking that each of us contains all these worlds inside us. And if today were the last day I knew I would live on Earth, every texture that passed through my hands would be perfect and immense. The knot in a shoelace, the rough hair on the back of his neck, the ferns, flint, and starchy waterproof. The weight of the littlest one on my back. All day he was tucking his commentary into my right ear as we walked up the hill and through the tangled branches. It was slippery and he was tired, but he was keen on cocoa. The thin pine stalks we snapped off to make a home on a fallen log, the bread and apples we shared there, planning to spend the night if we could find nothing better. These giant things, all of them ran through me every minute of the day. They are only inside me, the sense of them, ordered in my brain, scattering, not even contained by my flesh, which goes hot at the thought of losing them like the electricity he generates when he's jumping, and I found, plugging into the dark American house, like the signature your body makes on this screen. It is, you are, they are, running away faster than I can catch, and soon, utterly lost. My name, the relations gathered around the position I inhabited, what I felt and I longed for, were not me, the things themselves, the laughter and shouting of these voices that they themselves can't hear and won't remember. Their joy, how they go up like you in a puff of smoke. Yours, the operator. Opened. So quick to call fucking kids, but not to call shit a rifle. It was daytime in Vegas, nighttime there. We paid $170,000 to construct a mock Afghan mud and wattle building in China Lake behind the Taco Bell. We took melons, 
They're approximately as heavy as a human head and their rind comparable to the skin's ability to resist tearing. Ajax crushed the spines of sheep and cattle, but at least he thought they were men. Judging by their flayed skin and frag wounds, the experiment was typical. Whether we can extrapolate from this or not to children dancing to Ariana Grande or anywhere. Say I seek refuge in the Lord of Daybreak from the evil of that which he has created, and from the evil of darkness when it settles, and from the evil of blowers and knots. Say I do, what then? Activated. General Dick P. Formica is simply materials. He is specific and usually aggressive. He celebrates doing what he wanted to do for years at the fifth birthday party. Ready to eat a bullet himself, he instead chooses for the children crisps, sausages, pizza, carrot, cake. They run around like mad, buzzing, but he has taken them out in time. The party explodes in skirmishes. Two boys kick this girl who wants to join them and declares that she's a tomboy, but then one other picks her up and turns her upside down. And she's halfway between laughing and crying, and he's pile driving her into the pavement. And these other girls are driving the sticks left from the fruit kebabs into each other's eyes. And the boys have real vibes and a technique for overcoming the feeling of repulsion. The parents grab some drain opener and use it like riot police while the elders are impaled on truck parts. But the kids have improvised devices and strings to trap bare claws of anti-pastry around the infant's ankles. And then the hall is suddenly full of strangers and glimmering foil. There are as many of them as there are spaces between the children. The hall is a cube, so they're also stacked, triple the volume, is entirely taken up by these alien beings. In their clothes, they are as homogenous as angels. The brutality carries on anyway, and when everyone has turned to dust, all that remains is a strange gold cable. And that is why we despise war. Activated. Go ahead and throw down your sparkle. Thank you. Thank you, John and Andrea, for giving us the decided opposite of militainment. A word I'd never heard before. Did you coin that? It's a real word. Okay. Um, <laughs> now we all have it. Um, please come and look at the books before you go and talk to the poets and come back on March 13th for Lindsay Troy and Didi Machado. Thank you and good night. <laughs>